if anyone wants to talk about the moon base later, I'd be happy to talk about that. I won't be covering it here. Um, Bungani and I are just going to talk about the mission of ICON. I, uh, I moved to Austin, Texas to work at ICON about three years ago from Oahu, and I've been trying to get back ever since. So it's really cool to see all these, these Maui folks here. Um, so ICON is a construction technology company based in Austin. We're about six years old, and we were created really with one purpose in mind, and that's to address the housing crisis. Uh, simply put, we just don't build enough in this country and around the world. A very high-performing uh, home builder in this country might build 80,000 homes a year, and that's just not enough. We're millions of homes short. And so ICON set out to do things differently. And to do that, we realized we can't just build a better home incrementally. We just need a paradigm shift in the way we build and shelter ourselves. And so ICON set out to develop construction technologies that can deliver high-performing homes at a lower cost, quickly, and at scale. And so I think if you take one thing away from this presentation, I hope it's that the technology that you're going to see in our presentation today is out of the lab, so to speak. It's out, it's in the field, it's building things at scale, it's ready to go. I wanted to share this short clip in case folks in the room aren't familiar with what construction scale 3D printing looks like. You'll notice a few things in this video. The first is just how it works. So we send robots to a job site, and those robots extrude a cementitious material that layer by layer build homes, schools, and other structures. So we send robots to the job site, and that's where, we, that's where they do the work. Another thing you might notice is that we can print at night. In fact, the robots love to print around the clock. You can do things faster, it's not the next job. And I think the final thing you'll notice in this short clip here is that the structures just look really cool. They don't look like conventional homes. We can make them look like conventional homes, but the robot just does what we tell it to do. And so if we want to build a home in the shape of a circle or a dome, that's exactly what it'll do. So that's what it looks like on a job site. This way of building adds up to a handful of benefits, some of which you see here. The first is that they're just high-performing structures. And what we mean by that is they are more affordable to operate, to heat in the winter and to cool in the summer. They're easier to maintain and they last a lot longer. So they're just high performing structures. The second thing is that we can build really quickly because the robots don't ask for breaks. They just do what we tell them to do. That means we can build at night, get the job done, move on to the next one faster. And that adds up to affordability. The houses can also be more affordable in large part because we can move so fast. These next three benefits are really important. You all have an open invitation to come visit us in Austin. And when you do, I think you'll look around and to our lab and to our factory and realize that everyone's got kind of an energy about them. We all move and work with a sense of mission, like a lot of the people in this room. And that mission is to build a billion homes before we all retire. So it's a huge mission. And I think we have a shot at it. But if we're even remotely successful, at building a billion homes, and we don't have these three things in mind, we can actually do a great deal of harm. If we're building homes that aren't beautiful, if we're building homes that are ugly, we're not going to deliver on our mission to deliver dignified housing for everyone. And if we're not building with sustainable materials, and if we're not designing with sustainability in mind, we'll be in an even worse place environmentally. And then resilience is important too, because if we can build anything like a billion homes, and they're not built to withstand the kinds of disasters that we're talking about in this room, and after every disaster we have to rebuild those communities, that's not good either. So we take these three things really seriously at ICON, and we feel a great deal of responsibility about them. We've built over 150 structures. Um, so what Jen said at the beginning, I think is really important to call out, we're doing this at scale. From the first home we printed there in the upper left, 350 square feet, took about 48 hours of print time, all the way to delivering 100 home neighborhoods. We've come a long way in about six years. So these are just some highlights that you see here. Community First Village, I know a handful of folks in the room have been there. Uh, Governor Josh Green visited um, a couple years ago. This is a community in Austin that's designed to get people back on their feet 
Icon will have printed over 100 homes there when we're done. The home that you see here in the lower, F, lower left is a hurricane resilient home that we built on the Texas Gulf Coast. There's Krista Lopez in here. We couldn't have done that. There she is. We couldn't have done that without Krista at the GLO. Those homes we're really proud of. Those homes are meant to replace homes or did replace homes that folks lost to Hurricane Harvey in 2017. So you can imagine the profile of somebody who lost their home in 2017 to a hurricane and still didn't have one. That was with uh, CDBG DR funding. We've also built barracks of the kind that you see there in the lower middle. We built event spaces. So we do way more than homes. Um, and, but homes are really what we're most excited about. This is a home that we built in East Austin called House Zero. This is an architecturally award-winning home. We built this home really with one purpose in mind, and that was really to make a point. And the point we wanted to make is that 3D printed homes aren't just novel homes or really cool homes. They're actually just really good homes, period. And we think they can beat conventionally built homes on a number of factors. The one that's probably standing out the most here is beauty. So this home, we gave the architects really two pieces of direction. Design something that's mid-century modern inspired that could only be built with a robot. And this is what they came up with. We call it House Zero. Important thing to call it here is the homes that we're building in East Austin and elsewhere for affordable people, people who are just trying to get back on their feet, the same robot built those homes that built this home. So the robot, again, just does what we tell it to do. It can do luxury homes, it can do affordable homes. And another example I wanted to share with you is a 100-home neighborhood that we just finished north of Austin in Georgetown, Texas. This is 100 homes. The entire neighborhood was 3D printed. Uh, we did this in partnership with Lennar and the Bjarke Ingalls Group. But it's a pretty remarkable achievement for us because nobody had ever attempted something like doing 100 homes uh, all built by robots. And if you come to Austin, we'll be happy to show you a tour there. One thing I wanted to call out about this development was not just like technical achievement of building a 100 home neighborhood with robots, but these homes are on the market. They've sold, people are living in them. They're posting TikTok videos about how cool it is to live in these homes. So this is our first real signal that there is demand and there is interest from people to make the biggest investment of their lives in a 3D printed home. So that was a really validating figure for us. Talk a little bit about how the company is organized and how we, we sort these really complex problems. We're organized around these four areas. I'll talk about the first two and then pass it to Bungani to talk about the next two. But in short, we're focused around robotics, advanced materials, software, and architecture. The robot is what tends to get a lot of the media attention. We have two robots. The first one is called Vulcan. That's what's done over 150 structures. If we were to do a project tomorrow, it would be with Vulcan. If we were to do one in 26 or beyond, it would be with Phoenix. And I'll tell you why in a minute here. So Vulcan is a gantry style printer, which means that anything in this print bed it can deliver. So we've printed three homes in one print bed. You could print four homes in one print bed or just one big home in a print bed. Um, this is a, the printer that we're really most proud of because it's delivered everything that we've done so far. But it has some limitations, namely that it moves on those rails that you can see. And the rails take about 24 hours to set up, which doesn't sound like a long time in construction terms, but at Icon, it's just unforgivably slow because it adds cost to the, to the final product. And so, before I get to the next one, I just wanted to show you this picture. I really love this picture because it looks like maybe it's a job site on a Sunday morning. This is actually probably a Tuesday afternoon. And you can notice a few things about what an icon job site looks like. The first, I think, is that it's just very clean and it's very orderly. The second is that there aren't a lot of people on this job site. If you squint, you can see maybe six or seven people and they're just kind of monitoring the printers, monitoring the robots with tablets as they go. Another thing you'll notice is that we have six or seven robots deployed to this site. This is the 100 home neighborhood taken about halfway through the project. So it's, it's quite a sight to behold. I think when you step onto this job site, it's like stepping into the future somehow. You just feel like, why aren't we building this way everywhere? It's a very natural thing, um, but it looks very unnatural and very futuristic. But that's what Vulcan looks like on a job site. Phoenix is our new printer. And Phoenix is different in a number of key ways. The first is that, as you can see, it's got some tank treads there. And so we don't need 24 hours to set up. Phoenix can just roll onto a job site and start printing. So it's lower setup time, lower cost. And it also has a much bigger build volume, which means we can do multi-story. And so without setting up those rails, Phoenix can move around a job site, 
print a home, print a school, and then without even moving, it can just swivel to the other side of the job site and do the same there. So this is a much bigger capability, and this is what we're, what we're gonna be delivering all of our projects with starting in around 2026. But it's not just a rendering. We actually have an engineering prototype. This is a home that we call House of Phoenix, right across from our headquarters in Austin, Texas. It's actually just an architectural demonstration and the purpose of this demonstration was to show off what Phoenix could do, because we didn't want to ask people to just take our word for it and show them a rendering. So we created a prototype uh, Phoenix printer, and then we built this really beautiful sculptural structure. Um, that's our headquarters right there across the street. But it really does show off that, again, the robot just does what we tell it to do. It can print a rectangular box that looks like a conventional home, but why would you want it to if it could print something like that? So that's Phoenix. The second part of our company is advanced materials. I think the highest concentration of PhDs at ICON is in our advanced materials uh, department. So there's a lot I could say here, but for this room, the thing I wanted to, to share with you is that our new material is called Carbon X. We unveiled it in March of this year. It's a low carbon material. So we care a lot about sustainability and resiliency, but we print with a cementitious material. So we've always known that cement being the most, second most used material on earth after potable drinking water comes with a pretty large carbon footprint. So our material scientists have been working on a new material for quite some time that is low carbon, and that material is called Carbon X. An MIT University study of this material concluded it is the lowest carbon way of building a single family home compared to stick frame. This is pretty, pretty cool that we're faster, we think we're more beautiful, we think we're more affordable, and now we're also low carbon. So that's material. I'm gonna pass it to, oh, one more thing. This is our material batch plant in Austin, Texas. I wanted to share this with you just so you can all see that we have a material batch plant, which means we can test and iterate on the material in real time. So we're trying to be as vertically integrated as possible, uh, and this material batch plant is a great symbol of that. Now I'll pass it to Bogani to talk about our wall system. Thanks, Andrew. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we do with that technology stack and how we're actually able to deliver and print a, a printed home and structure. And so for anyone who's watched a home go up um, and under construction or spend some time on a job site or maybe it's your own home and you've done some remodeling, I want you to take a moment to think about like sort of what is involved in actually creating that exterior envelope. So this is a, a typical stick frame home that's built often, um, definitely throughout Texas. And you know, here in California, that exterior cladding probably changes. It might be brick, it might be uh, plaster on the side, but there's, there's all these layers. So if you think working from the outside in, you've got siding or plaster or brick, you've got the sheathing that's needed for structural purposes, you have the framing, you have the weather barrier, you have uh, insulation. And then on the inside, you get drywall, tape, float, and paint. A lot of different layers and also a lot of different trades involved. And those trades are busy, they're in high demand, and there can often be like delays in the time it takes to move from uh, one job site to the next job site. And some of the challenges the builders face today as well is that they will actually have a subcontractor who uh, will finish a group of homes and then say, okay, I've gotten a better price over at the next job site, I'm gonna move over there. You know, CMU block wall is not a lot different. The icon wall system, which you see on the right side, and printed wall systems in general, or a lot of them, they basically replace all of those uh, layers and different systems with um, a printed shell. So on the outside, we've got one printed shell, we've got insulation in the middle, and then we have the, uh, the printed shell on the interior side. And then we, you can apply block filler and paint or a clear coat. So this is a much simplified system. It's basically down to uh, three systems, of which there is really one trade involved in terms of like printing the wall itself. It is a fully reinforced system. It's a question that we, uh, we often get is, okay, this is a con concrete wall. Is there reinforcement in the system? And there is. There's actually several different uh, types of reinforcement. There's horizontal reinforcement that's in the print itself. There's some reinforcement that ties the two shells together. And then there's reinforcement that uh, connects the foundation, the wall, and the roof all together. And then in the middle, we're able to uh, have insulation. And these are actually very well-performing walls. So this is our standard wall. This is what we deliver for any project that we're going to be working on. Um, and really establishes the minimum requirements. And so this is equivalent to like an R22 wall. And this is a mass wall. So it, it's able to hold its energy and in a place, uh, in particular like the, the uh, west coast of Cal in California, um, in other areas where you have large temperature swings, that is actually fantastic because it, it, it reduces energy uh, consumption over the year. The other thing about this is that our standard wall 
comes with a two hour rating. We've tested for this. And it also is able to withstand up to 250 mile hour winds. So this is without any changes in the engineering. This is not adding additional sheathing, nailing patterns, or some of the other complexity that you get with uh, uh, stick framed walls. We're able to deliver this as part of our standard conventional approach. And we know this because we've done testing on our system. So uh, this is a video that runs through some of the structural testing that we've done. So we've worked with third party labs to actually check and confirm um, how does the wall actually perform? Because that's one of the questions that comes up is like, how do you know that your engineering works? Um, and we've uh, taken the time to do um, the main structural testing. We've also done fire rating testing. We've done the cyclic load testing that's necessary to get that wind rating so that we understand how we're actually able to design, build uh, with this particular system. This is a, 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 a favorite of ours in the office. So this is, uh, it's gonna play through a couple times, but this is for a tornado shelter. So we've taken an icon wall system that is a, about a 14 foot two by four, um, thrown at 100 miles an hour, 100 miles per hour. So this is for tornado shelters. Um, the wall survived, the uh, two by four did not. And in fact, there was actually like very minimal damage. You know, so that the, the great thing about the printed wall systems is its, is its durability and its strength that you get from it. Along with this, uh, in addition to doing all the testing, we've worked with a number of different organizations or are in the process of working with a number of different organizations, starting on the, the far, uh, your left, my right, um, we've worked with ICC. So right now, another question that comes up is, well, how are these, um, you know, these aren't built to code, there's no building code for this, is a common thing that you will see on social media. Um, I can say for all ICON structures, they have all been built to code, they've all been fully permitted, they've been designed by an engineer of record, and from what I understand of anybody else who's done 3D printing, that is also true. So in the absence of a specific code that goes in and, and you can't go in and look up and see, this is how you design for stick frame is what you can do in the code today. You don't have that section for printed construction. So ICCs develop what's called an acceptance criteria. And that defines how you're actually able to, uh, with testing, work with a printed system. So this is a publicly available document. You can go onto the ICC Evaluation Services website, look up uh, ICON under the reference manual, and you can see how our, our wall system is engineered. So this makes it accessible for other engineers to understand how to work with our wall system um, if, if there's ever a need to. That's all also backed up by uh, testing. We're, we are also involved in the actual writing of code. So um, ICC, ASTM, uh, and one or two other organizations are also working on um, ACI, American Concrete Institute, are working on how to actually develop um, codes, language that can go into building codes. And so we're involved in, in how that work is done along with um, folks from academia and other uh, organizations. So uh, Andrew mentioned the, the homes on the Gulf Coast that we did with the GLO. So there, there was a requirement um, to design to IBHS fortified um, standard. We were able to achieve gold standard. So like this isn't just about the walls, this is about the foundation connection, this is about the roof connections, the windows, the doors, so that um, people know that they have a higher chance that if there's a hurricane that comes through that they will not have loss of, of property. We have also started to explore and understand like what does it mean to actually create a printed structure that is able to uh, meet the requirements for IBHS wildfire prepared program and the firewise program. As you are all keenly aware of the home in itself and how you actually protect the home is only a small portion of that. It is also about how you design the community itself. And then lastly, we're in the closing stages of um, working with the state of Florida for high wind uh, certification um, so that we're able to basically build in the highest wind zones in, in, in the country. And then of course, a big question for this group I'm sure is like, okay, well, where, where, are, you, where are you at with seismic right now? So right now, th that uh, acceptance criteria that I mentioned that ICC has developed um, it really only allows for seismic design categories A and B. So there is still work to be done on how you can actually get into seismic zones C, D, uh, and, and, and up. So today, we can do a 3D printed wall that basically conforms to the existing code. But that basically means you're just using that printed wall as formwork. You're then filling it in um, and really creating a, a concrete um, reinforced wall that, that conforms to the code. We have started down the, the path, and it, it takes a while to do the testing and the design to understand how can you create a natively based uh, printed wall system that is able to withstand seismic loads. And the idea behind that is we want to be able to deliver that same speed and efficiency and durability that we have um, with our standard wall system with a seismic wall system as well. And the whole point to this and what we're really interested in doing, and you saw this in some of the projects we worked on, is that we really want to be able to create beautiful structures. So you'll see here some examples of this freedom of form. So the printer 
doesn't really mind if it goes in a straight line or if it's running in a curve um, and, or if it's be able to create uh, unique patterns. And the idea is that we're able to create some variation and some beauty in homes that otherwise today really aren't receiving them. If you go to a production builder site, they are doing the best that they can to deliver the lowest cost home possible. I'm not sure that we would all agree that they're not necessarily like beautiful homes, but they are very keenly interested in making sure that those are as low as cost as possible so that they can be as, as affordable as possible. So we think 3D printed technology provides the opportunity to add and return beauty to these structures. So these are, these are all actual structures and, uh, that have been delivered. Um, these were, were actually delivered to a customer in the Austin area. Um, and this is a pavilion that you can see in Austin itself. It's, it's, it's on the south shores of uh, Ladybird Lake in Austin, Texas. I wanted to call it Town Lake for anybody who's been to Austin, but it's Ladybird Lake today. Um, and it is out across from the Long Center. So this is an entirely 3D printed structure um, that we created and, and uh, unveiled at South by Southwest uh, last year. And it's something that is uh, available for anyone to go and see. And, and you actually can watch YouTube videos of people trying to uh, skateboard and ride their bikes across it as well. And then this is a shot of the inside of House of Phoenix. And so this is inspired, uh, I'm sure that anybody who's been through some of the canyons that are in the West Coast, coastal areas, that this is what this is inspired by. And so this is really being able to return beauty with 3D printed construction. Um, and do it in a way that's cost effective and that can be more accessible to, to lots of folks. And the big idea is that we want to be able to take all of this and really turn it into um, homes and make those, the whole home uh, process accessible um, so that the time that it takes to, do, to build the home is just a portion of the work that goes into actually completing construction. There's a lot of work that's in the design side. And so to help address that, one of the things we did um, is to incorporate these forms is to actually launch Codex. So today, during a break at some point, you can go to our website um, and you can go to Codex. And Codex is a, co a digital collection of homes that um, is available for uh, design and printing. You can explore them. They range in size. There's over 40 homes uh, on the site. They range in size from 750 square feet to uh, well over 4,000 square feet. And you're intended to hit across all price points. And really, this is just the beginning. The idea here is that we are going to continue to add to the Codex collection. And that uh, a developer, a community, a builder would be able to go onto this website, identify which homes that they want to be able to build, download all the information that is necessary for them to execute that print as well as the construction process, um, and be able to deliver those homes in a timely manner. So today, right now, it's, there's information you can see here, you're able to, to really change the way that you're able to interact with a home before it is actually built and understand um, what it might be like to live in that home in these dollhouse, uh, manipulable dollhouse uh, uh, models. There are full renderings that show uh, how these homes can be built. And this is actually a picture of a community that we've actually just started building just outside of Austin, Texas. Um, this style of, uh, of home is called uh, the part of the Alpha Beta Collection. And within that Codex Collection, we've imagined um, a series of other possible collections, including TexNext, um, which is uh, a Texas-inspired theme of, of homes, as well as the larger Alpha Beta Collection, as well as some other uh, one-off projects that we've created. And we've also started to consider and contemplate what it actually would mean to create um, a fire home collection. So what does that actually look like to create a, a, and print a home that is uh, fire resilient? And then lastly, the, the thing that uh, we've also worked on and released is uh, Vitruvius, which is an AI architect. So this is really intended to address that question around how can you actually create um, and provide the flexibility for people to go in and have an interactive experience and access to an architect that can help them design their own home. So uh, again, during a break today, or after I'm done speaking, um, you can go onto, Vitru onto the website and you can uh, start to interact with Vitruvius today. And it'll give you some renderings, um, a floor plan, and uh, some interior views. It's in a beta form right now. The idea is that eventually this will actually be able to help address all the stages through construction so that someone will be able to go on, onto the site have an interaction with the AI itself, um, and uh, be able to um, get some inspiration of, of what their home might possibly look like. And you can actually have some fun with this um, right now. You can deliver something that is very conventional or traditional, um, or you, there are some rather like otherworldly uh, options and styles that are possible to choose from, which you'll see an example of here. And so like you can actually also go and explore um, 
all of the other generations that they've uh, or that folks have, have considered. I've actually created like a Pokemon house and a, uh, a Minecraft home. So like you can have some fun with the AI itself. It's not all um, currently based fully in reality. And so what we're really interested in um, here at Icon is how can we actually develop the, the tools, not just the construction methods, but also how do we solve those other technological problems that exist within other parts of the, the home delivery process. And so I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us today um, to really think about how can we actually create and build a better future? What are the tools that we need? What are, um, what are the, the, the barriers that currently exist? And how do we actually start to solve some of those uh, problems so that we can have uh, communities be rebuilt faster, that we can deliver more ho uh, housing at more affordable price points, um, and really create a, uh, a different uh, way of, of building our homes and structures. She wants, she wants us to break out the AI. It's what it's Stan. Thank you. Um, virtually every picture I see a pancake flat site where, where, the, uh, where the machine can run. Uh, what's the ability to build on slope? So today, um, so like at that Wolf Ranch site, we are able to uh, handle a change in grade of around up to like six or seven feet. And so like that is one of the challenges with the Vulcan printer. Um, and so yeah, most of those pictures appear to be like relatively flat slopes or flat sites. Um, and that is one of the benefits of why, you know, uh, we see that Phoenix is really the, the way and future forward. Um, and because it is able to traverse and deal with better uh, terrain and you don't have to have um, that, all that setup time to be able to actually like level the rails and get everything set up and, and working properly. Sure, I'm Amanda with IBHS. So um, I have a question about repairs. So if for some reason it cracks or anything like that on the side, how would, is it easy to repair? Like, wh how does that work? Yeah, so uh, how we address repair is that we actually provide um, homeowners, when they get their home, they actually get a, a manual and a kit that actually tells them how to interact and work with a 3D printed structure. And so inside that, it actually tells them how to do like very basic repair. So one of the common questions that you'll see um, the people ask on social media and they ask us very regularly is, you know, how do I hang up a picture? How do I hang up a TV? And uh, that is actually very straightforward. You can go down to Home Depot, you can grab the, the necessary masonry tools, um, and you can create that hole. Now, what happens if you put that TV or the picture in the wrong spot, or you've just bought it, you're, you're the second owner of a 3D printed home? Um, you can actually go down also to, to Home Depot or Lowe's or your local uh, hardware store and buy the same supplies that allow you to basically fill that hole and then be able to paint right over top of it. Um, so, you know, larger scale damage um, or any repairs that have to be undertaken, you know, if there's actual structural damage to the wall, you'd have to do the same thing as, as work with a structural engineer to get that repaired. Um, any other like cosmetic damage, um, there, are, there are also instructions on how to work with that as well as how to access like any of the MEP systems or anything else along those lines. A couple questions that came up, sorry, Crystal Lopez. Um, those guys know who I am, but um, <laughs> questions that came up when we were building for disaster survivors in Texas were like, how do you put electric in? How do you, you know, lay the utilities? How do I, you know, set my house up to look like a normal house? Because we had a lot of people who were afraid that if we built them a 3D printed house, they would stand out in their neighborhood. We had this conversation about how to make folks feel like it was normalized to be that type of home in their neighborhood. So can you talk about utilities first and then just kind of how the house can be shaped to fit the community? Yeah, so the, from a community perspective, you know, that's something that we engage in with uh, the developer or the builder who's working on the project and that really sets the character. So the, the Wolf Ranch project, um, there was a master developer in addition to working with Lennar that helps establish the character and the look of those homes so that they do fit into the surrounding community. Um, with respect to like electrical and plumbing, um, that is all integrated into the wall system and is, in, in, is part of the construction. And what we do is we actually work to make it so that the trades have uh, as easy access to anything that they need to get to. So that for them, it isn't a massive change in the way that they're, they're actually able to put in electrical or plumbing or anything else and the like. Um, and, and the same thing is we also provide homeowners with information on you know, where are the pipes located so that they understand that if they have an issue with a sink or a shower or something like that, that they don't have to break through a concrete wall 
um, to get at it, that it is actually just behind um, either a, a vanity or the, uh, the tile in their shower, the same as it would be in a, in a framed home and wall. I have a question. So one of the barriers that we see all the time to innovation, and we have to innovate in order to get to the, through this next era of climate change, is the understanding of local permit um, companies, I'm sorry, uh, the local government often has trouble with that. And also, have you encountered any um, opposition from unions, like carpenters unions, that could be a big barrier because they reasonably want to protect their constituency, which I'm very pro-union and understand, but have you come up against that? Because what I'm hoping is the message is, is that they can actually be trained to build the future, but how do you deal with the sort of barriers to um, innovation, to the entry part of that? We haven't had that issue yet. In, in Central Texas, like a lot of parts of the country, there's a construction labor shortage. Uh, we see that trades are retiring and their children and grandchildren are coming into the trades. and so. That hasn't been an issue we face yet, but I think we're prepared to deal with it where and when we face it, because for exactly the reason you pointed out, Jen, um, this is still a construction industry. Um, people who used to swing a hammer can now operate a robot. We have print operators who come from all walks of life to Icon, and within a matter of weeks, uh, they're operating a robot. They're the first people in the history of humanity to ever hold that job. And so there's an opportunity to train local workforce on jobs of the future, there are a lot of opportunities that we hear from, um, that we get from universities and local municipalities to do STEM education. So it's something that I think we would actually embrace and, and run toward rather than um, try to put up our defenses and, and avoid. Um, I just want to say that was a great question from Jen. I'm, so I'm Jennifer Lassar. I own the Lassar portfolio of, of companies. We work on um, systems change related to housing and homelessness and, and the affordability crises. Andrew, you, you speak my language when you talk about a billion houses in, in your lifetimes. And my, my so just on Jen's follow-up, so we, we work on um, a scaling strategy, which is how to think about in California planning for and building 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 units at a time. And we've done financial modeling and we've been costing it out, looking at modular housing. Um, and I will say Factory OS, which I think declared bankruptcy, did work with the carpenters. They're, they're the one place where the unions have found an entree point, so just FYI. But my question to you is, um, at what point, you're showing 100 unit communities right now, but at what point would you be able to begin to cost out, you know, if, if I can show you a community, Fresno, 10,000 units around the high speed rail, San Diego, three to 5,000 units. At what point would you all be willing or able to cost out what it would take to write, build your robots and bring them to a community and know what that sweet spot is of like how many homes or how much right dollar volume that, that we would be able to deliver to you to, for you to build your product and would you be able to you know sort of say it's gonna be at this cost per square foot? Because I think that's where you know, we, we in California know we need at least 2.5 million units. And so we're thinking, how do we do that again? Not one 200 unit project at a time, but 2,000, 5,000 units. So just want to know where you are in your, your scaling planning and able to articulate that to people like me and my clients who are, are trying to solve that problem today. I'd answer it in a few ways. And Bongani, maybe you have some thoughts as well. I'm, the first is that to build a, a billion homes, our 350 person company can't do that. We need to take this technology and put it in the hands of other people. And so that's, that's the next chapter of our company is getting Phoenix ready for serialized production so that we can sell it and lease it to people all around the world so that they can create their own companies and together we can build a billion homes. Um, when would we be ready to start modeling something like that out for your community? Today. We could start doing that today. We, we like to say that the new minimum for a project is 100 homes. Um, in fact, we have projects in our pipeline that are far bigger than that and some that are smaller than that as well. But we know how long these things take. And so uh, challenge accepted. We, we would start on that with you today. And then the, the last thing I would say is um, you saw a lot of single family, single story homes in our slideshow. One of the benefits of Phoenix is that it can do multi-story. So Phoenix can do two, three stories of 3D printed floors, and then we can build conventionally on top of that. So we know that we need to 
to run into our multifamily future, and Phoenix is going to help us with that as well, so we can build densely. Hi. I was really excited when I said the last time you were here, and I'm even more excited now. Do you currently have structures, houses in particular, that can be built in places in California like Sonoma County, Marin County, uh, anywhere along any of our major faults that would be permitted? So we, we have actually been talking to folks that are in uh, seismic design, like, so seismic design categories is how structural engineers classify the loading that's placed on the, on, uh, the structure from a seismic perspective. And so most of California is in, you know, C, D, E, and F. Um, and so we actually have been in talks with folks to be able to deliver homes and structures um, in those higher seismic design categories. What we're, and we're, we would be able to do that, um, you know, we're, we're basically doing bookings right now in like the 2025. Um, we'd be able to do that now. Um, what we are working towards is being able to have a uh, really a custom like designed 3D printed wall that is able to be delivered affordably at scale. So like where we're actually using the 3D printed material as the structure, as opposed to just having it use it as uh, formwork. But today we would be able to do that. So that that is we have and we have been having conversations with folks in the in those seismic design categories. I would like to say this too, and thank you so much for making this um, this trek out here. Because one of the things in, for people who work in climate all the time, as I'm sure you know, is that we need hope, and we cannot just do this climate doom where we all escape to this one corner of the universe together. There's not enough room for us, but also, I I definitely see the people um, of Icon and the people in your company is running towards the future to solve the problem. And one of the things that we need to also look at is we're not just talking about building new homes or rebuilding in areas that have been affected by mega fires or other disasters, but we're also, we have a real shot here and making sure that they actually don't burn down again. I mean, that is, that is not really in the rest of the market of home building in the same way as you guys are tackling. And it's a big problem. And I'm just so grateful to you for making this trek and the work that you do. I'm a super fangirl, as most of you have probably gotten some kind of hysterical email from me, like, have you seen this? Have you watched them on 60 Minutes? Because it really is big, dreaming, important work. And so I want to thank you so much for that. Well, thanks very much for having us. And, and do go online, and you can go explore both Codex as well as uh, have some fun with Vitruvius AI, either designing a very serious home or just uh, having some fun as well. It can be a bit of a, a time suck if you start doing it at work. <laughs> Okay, all right, and thank you so much.